What's up everyone, I'm H. Cynic and welcome to part 1 of the complete beginner's guide to Minimator version 1.1. whatever the update is. So if you're watching this video, I'm going to assume that you know that Minimator is a basic, simple Minecraft animation tool that you can use to make your own personal, customized Minecraft animations. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. We're going to download the software. There's a couple of different options here. Let's go ahead and scroll on down. This is the official Minimator website. I'll have a link in the description for this. But you're going to come on down here and click download or I'll just have the link to this specific page in the description. So you'll get presented with these two options. Now in the past, I've always just used the archive. But for this example, we're going to go with the installer. Basically, it's the same thing. But this allows you to just download the install folder and put it wherever you want. Whereas this one's going to actually install the software the way you would have any other software installed and you can choose where to put this one as well so there's not really much of a drawback in my opinion but if some reason you find one works better than the other then I recommend you do what works best for you. So we're just going to click on download installer here then we're going to get this we're going to go ahead and save the file. Now one thing I would like to note here is that there are a lot of antiviruses that will give you a hey you know maybe Windows Defender is like hey this this isn't trustworthy the software is bad or whatever and it's to my understanding it's basically just because Minimator is not really a well-known software to these companies so it's a false flag tons of people use Minimator all the time and uh, have no issues with it so there's no need for alarm it's perfectly safe as long as you download it from the official source now I can't help you if you download it somewhere else and you get a virus or something if you download it from the official site though you should be good to go all right let's go ahead and install this I have a uh, folder over here I'm just gonna go ahead and click on the file that we downloaded I'm sure you know how to do that I'm gonna double click here on the Monimator installer file. And we have this little uh, thing here. It's not really that big of a deal. We're gonna accept the agreement. We're gonna click next. And then this is where it's gonna ask me where to put it. Now, I don't want it installed here, so I'm gonna move it, but it's up to you. I recommend if you want to mess with the files or know what's going on, you move it to a place that you can keep up with. So I'm just gonna click on browse and I'm just gonna put it uh, right here where I want it. And we're gonna hit okay, next and this already exists because I already had a previous install. Let's just go ahead and hit yes and see if we can overwrite that. Hopefully that won't cause us any problems, but we'll see. We're experimenting here. So in this little window here, you can choose not to create a start menu folder. I don't have an issue with that, so I'm just going to go ahead and let that go, and we're going to click next. And on this one, we're going to go ahead and tell it to make a desktop shortcut so it's easy to get to, and then we're going to hit next again, and everything seems to be what we want it to be. I'm going to hit install. And there we go. Now we can hit finish and launch Minimator and let's see what happens. All right, so Minimator is launched and this is what you'll see when you first bring it up. Uh, as far as I know, as long as the window is maximized for you and everything, it should look just like this. And we are running 1.1.2. So what we're gonna do here is click create new project or a new project button right there. And we're just gonna name this. And we're gonna call this one uh, Beginner's Guide. And it's going to put it in the default projects folder, which exists in the Monimator install folder that uh, we talked about during the installation process. So we're okay with that. And we're going to click create. All right. So here we are in Monimator. We got it installed and everything's good to go. We started a project. We've named it. We're good. So now how do we get to know this interface? What does everything do? Where do we begin? So let's go ahead and just start off with the top toolbar here. This is where your main, you know, interest is going to be mostly right here in the workbench. It looks like a crafting table. And when you click that, this is where all of your basic stuff is going to be. This is how you're going to bring in characters. This is how you can import scenery. This is how you can bring in items, individual blocks, special blocks like animatable chests and things like that you can bring in body parts and build your own custom mobs you can bring in particle systems you got point lights you got spotlights you even got dang old text and then down here we have just a bunch of random 3d shapes or a surface which is just a flat kind of 2d shape this is where you bring in a camera so you can do all the camera work and cinematography for your animations this is the background tab, which will basically, or not tab, but a timeline where if you click on this, it will bring a timeline for the background so that you can animate the sun and the moon and the timing of your day. In the course of your animation, you can bring in audio here. And this one here is for bringing in external model files. That's kind of a hard thing to say um, from other programs 
or things that other people have made and then the future model bench if, that, if I'm getting the name right there. So just to go ahead and get started we're just going to go ahead and plop in a human character. I'm going to click on this and as you can see you got your full list of options here. You can scroll up and down with your scroll wheel on your mouse. You have a variant option so if I click on this it goes to Steve or Alex. We're just going to leave it on Steve by default. You've got the skin option here where you can change it. It's by default the Steve skin. You can browse your computer if you have other skins like for instance your own player skin or you can even click download Minecraft user skin. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to go anxious cynic because that's my Minecraft username downloading. All right, for some reason I got an error at first, but then I click get skin again and there it is. It came in. So we're going to hit done. There we go. There is my skin. I'm going to create that and there I am, man. Oh, hang on. We've already been messing with this project a little bit earlier, so uh, sorry about that. Now we're at zero. I just changed the position. As you notice, when you have a character in your timeline, I'm going to go ahead and close this little window here uh, just because we don't need it because we don't have a camera in our scene. So I'm going to click that X and all I have to do is click this button up here if I want to bring that back and I can click it again to get rid of it again. All right, so this is what you'll see when you first bring in an object or a character or whatever into your scene. You get this timeline down here. We're going to click on it. So you'll see that this enables this pane over here, which is containing all of the options and the animatable parameters for your character and then over here you get the properties for that object or that character or whatever the case may be you can do custom rotation points you can do the graphics tab which allows you to change certain options such as blur the texture if you wanted to do such a thing and uh, stuff like that we can get into that i have previous tutorials on it but uh, that's basically where all of the default options, these are not animatable to my understanding. You cannot animate parenting, which we'll get into in a later part. But uh, yeah, this is all the default stuff for your character or the object that you have. And these are the typically animatable parameters. You can animate the position, you can animate the rotation, you can animate the scale. If we click on this button, we can drop down the scale and animate them on individual parameters. So I can make Steve wide, I can make Steve tall, I can make him thick like that. <laughs> anyway, and then what I'm doing here is right clicking on these numbers in order to reset them. So if I drag this up and I'm like, whoa, I don't want that. So I can right click on it and then that resets it to its default position. And then here I can click this button again and then that will cause this to scale all at once. So it just makes Steve big like that. All right. So that's just kind of a brief overview of these panes that you get. You have the color pane. You can up the brightness on a character. Basically, that just makes it so that you don't get shadows. So it just makes them completely bright and impervious to the lighting of your scene. That's something else we can get into later. And of course, here is the texture for our character. As you can see, I have this, and this is actually keyframeable. You can change the texture throughout the animation if you so desired. And then here we have keyframe, and this allows you to select transitions, which I have a video on. If you're not familiar with those, I suggest you look it up. And the visibility of the character, which can be keyframed. So if we click on this, then he's invisible. And then here he's visible. So if you wanted a character to appear at a certain point, something like that, then uh, that's what you would typically use. So those are the basics of the panes that you get over here. And then over here is our basic timeline. This is where you edit things over time and create animation. So if we click on this little arrow here, we can drop down all of the options for the character. We have a root character here. We have the body, which we can bend and do things with and then you have the head and so on and so forth all the parts of the character are contained within this whoops there's my taskbar in addition to that one thing i want to note is that by default you can click on the character just here in the 3d view and if i click on it again then you'll see that it actually drops that down and automatically selects the timeline and the part that you selected in the 3d view so if i click on his right arm you'll see that that's selected so on and so forth so uh, that's another way that you can interact with the timeline down here. Another thing to note about all these areas, these timelines and the, the panes over here and the toolbar up here, all this stuff can be adjusted. Mine's already been adjusted slightly since I installed the software, but you know, you can see this here, like so that adjusts and this adjusts over here. This can adjust over here. One thing I will note is that notice you have these buttons down here. They're not enabled yet because we haven't selected anything or done anything that would enable them. But if we had, sometimes you may adjust this and then you'll lose these buttons down here. So make sure you 
keep an eye on that in case you're missing something and you know you don't know where it went so that's basically all we're going to get into down here into the timeline i'm just left clicking and dragging this around here like so if you want to know how to move in the 3d view i'm just left clicking and holding and then drag around and that will orbit and it will typically orbit around whatever you have selected if you have nothing selected then it'll be wherever it was last left out or wherever you've moved the camera if i right click and hold then i can look around like so and if I want to move, I can keep holding right click and I can hit the W key and that will go forward. I can use the S key that goes backwards, A goes left and D goes right. Just like if you were playing Minecraft itself or any first person shooter game. If I hit the E key, it goes up and if I hit the Q key, it goes down. So those are the default key binds for moving around within the 3D view. What I can also do when I'm moving around, if I hold right click and use those keys, the WASD and Q and E and all those things, I can also move faster or slower. So if I hold the shift key and I hit W, you'll notice that I'm moving much slower. But if I just hold W, then I move this quickly. So that's the default speed. And if I hold the space key, I move super fast. And uh, that can be helpful in kind of fine tuning where you're aiming and all that kind of good stuff in the scene and you know help you with your animating and even modeling to some extent. So basically up here on the top toolbar you have your usual buttons. You can create a new project. You can import an asset. So in Minimator you can save keyframes or just save different types of things. You can make rigs and save them and they save as their own type of file. And then if you want to save something, let's say you created a walk cycle and you save those keyframes, you can click on this button in an entirely new project go to that keyframe file and bring it in to a character in your new project so you don't have to create a new set of walk cycles or anything every single time unless you just wanted to. Over here we have the open existing project. This is where we can go and open a project that we worked on before. You can save a project here and with this button you can create a new copy of the project when you're saving it in case you don't want to save over the last version. These over here are your render and export animation and still frame buttons. This is where you would go once you're done with your scene if you just want to export a still image or a video animation. We'll get into these at a later time throughout this tutorial series but those are what those are. I already explained this one to you earlier so we've got that going on. Then you have your settings button here. We'll get into that in a moment. You have undo and redo buttons, play, stop, and repeat in case you want to kind of loop a certain area of the animation. Right here is where you'll see the timeline marker. So if I move this timeline here, you'll see up here the time changes and we see exactly how long in the timeline we're playing. So right now, by default, Minimator is set to a tempo. If I come over here to project, this is where we see the name of everything the project folder, the resolution. I'm actually going to go ahead and up this while we're in here to 1080p because that's what I like to do. And the default tempo is 24. So that basically means in Minimator that it's going at 24 frames per second. Typically, I think people like to use 30 frames per second. So for me, that's typically what I use. I'm going to go ahead and up that to 30. So then now you'll see down here when this is at 24, it now says that is 0.8 of a second. So if I move this up to 30, that is now one second in length. So that's kind of how the tempo and the timeline work together. So to keep it simple, I would recommend putting your tempo at 30, but it really depends on what you're doing. And once you're familiar with the software, you can play with that and do all kinds of things that you may want to do. So now that we've gotten into this area over here, we're going to go ahead and close the project one. We're going to open up library and you'll see here, this is some previous stuff that I opened up and you'll notice that these say use count zero. And then this one here that we have is a use count of one. So this is where everything that you import to your scene is stored. It's going to be in the library whether or not it's actually in the scene or in the timeline. So let's say I opened up a torch and I got rid of it. I deleted it down here. If I click on Steve here I can delete him like so and he's no longer in the timeline but his object, his character, is still over here in the library. So I'm like oops I didn't mean to delete Steve or I thought I wouldn't need him and now I do and fortunately I still have this so I'm going to go ahead and click this button right here and that's going to bring him back into our scene. Let's create a new instance of this template in the timeline and that's what that would do. Then over here you have this button, create a new template and this is basically the same thing as opening the crafting bench or the workbench here. As you can see it just drops it down so that's the same thing there and then you can actually delete things out of the library by clicking the delete tool or button and uh, you have the duplicate the given template so I can click that and that will duplicate that item 
in the library and of course not add it to the timeline because we had to click this button if we wanted to do that. So that's the basics of how the library can be used and what it's meant to do. But you also have this option here where I have this torch object. Let me actually delete that. We're gonna go back to the Steve character and you see here the model it says Steve because when these are selected, if I click on this, these options change here. So I'm gonna click on Steve. It says the model is this and the skin is this and I can change that here if I want to. I can say make that a Minecraft Steve and you'll see there that the model has now changed in 3D port. If I come down here and go to change, I can actually tell it I want it to be something else entirely. It's like, maybe I want Steve to be a zombie this time or a skeleton or whatever. And I can choose whatever I want him to be or whatever I want that character object to be. So there you go. Now he's a pig with a saddle, which I guess is the perfect uh, transformation for my character, which is kind of sad. So that pretty much covers that. We're gonna go on down to the background tab. And this is where you change all of the options for your scene, such as the lighting, the clouds, the fog, all those great things that make your animation unique and interesting. We can actually make the ground disappear. We can make it reappear. We can make the clouds go away. We can make the clouds come back. We can show the clouds as 3D or we can make them flat. We can actually adjust the speed of the clouds. I'm gonna reset that. We can adjust their height. We can adjust how thick they are or how wide this, you know, spread apart they are, all these things, like so. So this is a lot of stuff we'll play with later on, but this is basically just where you control the overall look of your animation, the time of day, all those great things like that. We can use this rotation here to change which side the uh, stuff is on, all that good stuff. Like I said, we'll get into that at a later time, but that's basically what the background tab does. I have other tutorials on more advanced things to do with it. So all that stuff, all of my old tutorials for the most part will translate to this new version. There are some changes though that we'll probably cover in this series. Down here in the resource tab though, you will notice that we have what the objects are using in our scene. So for instance, I downloaded my skin to that character. So the resources is where any outside objects or you know resources basically are used in your scene so skins and textures and things like that are going to be stored down here uh, it doesn't really matter you probably won't be using this too much but if you wanted to bring in something like say a skin and use it for later but you just wanted to go ahead and have the program with all the files that you want to use and everything set up you could come in here you could click on this button here and then go find that skin and bring it in so like nothing would actually be in the scene yet using it but it would be in the program so that when you say went to bring in a character you could click on this and then that skin would appear here instead of having to go search for it when you're bringing in the character that might be a little bit more information than you need to know right now but just to give you an idea of uh, what that tab does so that pretty much covers all the project properties tabs now we're going to move into the settings tabs so the first one we have here is program and this is basically going to show you the version of Minimator you're using this is going to show the frames per second that it's running at so if I click on this button here this is what allows us to render the scene and see what the final lighting is gonna look like. And you see the render FPS is 30. Let's up that to 60 and see what changes. Go ahead and reset that. And then now our render frames per second is 60. So I don't really know if you need it to be 60. It kind of depends on what project you're working on, but that's basically what that does. You've got all your default backup options here enabled. We're just gonna leave that be probably. Spawn objects near the camera. That's not that big of a deal copy work camera into new camera. So basically what that means is if I move the work camera here, so I'm like, yeah, this is a good angle. I think I want to start doing my camera work now. So I'm going to come over here, click this. I'm going to click on the camera. I'm going to click create. And then it's automatically put where my viewport was. So now if I rotate away, you will see that that's where the camera stays and uh, it's good to go. One thing to note here is when you have a camera in the scene, this controls the exact same way I showed for this one. So you can right click and hold and look around, W, all that good stuff. All right, so we're gonna go into the next option, which is interface. And basically this is something you can leave alone unless you wanna customize the colors of your scene and things like that. These are all the colors of the interface. You can make it look however awesome or terrible you prefer to make it look. It's entirely up to you. You just click on all these and change the colors of things. See that? Just like so. I may be making a custom color scheme for myself, so uh, if you guys want to see it, I will try to provide a download for that at some point in time. But for now, we're just going to use the default look. Then you have these options down here. Auto scroll when playing animation is basically just going to mean that this area here is going to jump if you're playing an animation. It will jump to the next side to keep up with that timeline cursor there. 
So typically I don't think that's much of an issue. You can leave that on or take it off if you want to. It doesn't really matter. The next option you have here is compact timeline list. And basically to illustrate what that does, we're just gonna go ahead and expand the pig. And you see the space that we have in between these here. As you can see, this automatically came up this pane for the options that we can animate because I clicked on this. So uh, if I click away from it, it goes away. Or you can actually just go in between these tabs here like so. So if I click on compact timeline list, you will see that all this stuff gets kind of scrunched up together. Personally, I like this better. It does make it where you may, you know, kind of misclick on a different timeline or something, but I like to be able to see more, get more, uh, you know, out of the real estate that I have down here. So I'm actually gonna leave that ticked. And uh, yeah, that's up to you what you wanna do. Jump to selected object in timeline list is basically what I showed you earlier. When you click on something, it automatically jumped to it in the timeline here. I think that's a pretty useful tool, so I don't see any reason to disable it, but if you so desired, you could totally do that. Another thing I'm gonna enable here is the Z is up because currently Y is up. Let me go ahead and drop down the position. You'll notice that the position option is not always enabled. It depends on what you're selecting. Certain uh, body parts and whatnot don't have that enabled by default because you typically wouldn't wanna move their position. It's mostly just a rotating object but you can drop that down if you do want to animate the position. So in this instance, if I go ahead and mess with the Y, you'll see that the pig is moving up and down. Typically in 3D programs, I believe Z is the up and down axis, but for this one, for my animator here, it kind of goes back and forth. So what I'm gonna do is say, I want Z to be up, and you'll see that the uh, arrows there changed a little bit. So if I come back here and I say Z, then there you go, it's moving up and down. So this is pretty preferential. I typically like it this way. So if you watch most of my tutorials, you will see the Z is gonna be the up and down for me. But if not, it's gonna be Y for you and that's perfectly fine. It just depends on what you prefer. So now we're gonna go to the controls tab here. And this is basically all the keyframe shortcuts and all the, you know, the different keys that do things in Minimator and what they do. And you can change these or customize them to whatever you want them to be. You can tick the control key. So that means the control key would have to be clicked or held down, I think, for this to operate. I never really mess with any of this stuff, but if you so desire, you totally can. Down here, you have the move speed, as you may have noticed when I showed you earlier how you moved in the 3D view. Well, you can change how fast or slow that is here by upping or lowering or whatever the uh, value here. So the fast modifier means this is how fast it will move if you're holding the space key. The slow modifier is how fast it will move if you're holding the shift key, like I talked about. And then the look sensitivity and the move speed are the default movement speeds of those things without holding any of those other keys. So that's pretty much it for the controls tab. We're gonna go into graphics and you'll notice here that we have sharp and round. So basically what that is, let's go ahead and change our character back into a Steve click that and so what we have here is the default bending for a character so by default it is set to sharp so let's go ahead and bend Steve's arm there like so and you'll see that he's got this very square look to him so if I want to have round bending what I'm going to do is go to default bending here I'm going to go round bending I'm going to go over here and just spawn in another character so we're going to spawn in a zombie we're going to go ahead and just bend his arm a little bit and you'll see here that his arm has a non-square, it's got a, a round look to it. So let me go back into settings here and we can actually adjust how detailed that is by dragging this bending detail button or slider up or lower. Personally, I think you should stick with sharp because that's kind of what Minecraft looks like. I've used round bending in the past, but I switched back to sharp some time ago. Uh, you'll notice here that I changed the default bending back to sharp but his remained curved. Well, that's because this is just the default. So it only changed because I brought this in after I changed this setting. But what you can do, if you don't want him to have round bending anymore, then we can go over to his properties and we got left arm properties, this is for the zombie. And I can say round bending off and then that'll take it right back to where that is. So this is just the default, but you actually have this option enabled for every character in their properties. So for instance, I'm gonna click on Steve here. I'm gonna say, hey, I want you to have round bending. And this is in the graphics tab, as you can see in the left arm properties that shows up over here. So I'm gonna click on that and that gives Steve the round bending. So this just makes it the default when you spawn in a new character. And this is how you can adjust it by a character by character basis or something like that. The other options we have here is remove edges from big schematics. This is supposedly gonna help improve the performance of Minimator if you have a big schematic in your scene. Not that big of a deal. I've never really paid much attention to it or noticed much effect for it, but 
you know, it's up to you. Water and lava animation. This is, uh, you know, you can play with this when you bring in a water or lava block. There's a certain animation to it. I'm not going to show it here right now because we're trying to move on along. But that kind of gives it the sort of wavy look to the top or something. And that's enabled or disabled by default. You can probably leave it enabled unless you really want to look just like Minecraft without any special stuff going on. Texture filtering has to do with certain like mip mapping with like the way uh, certain objects I think with transparency are displayed and things like that. If I click it off. You may see here that the grass looks totally different, so I'm going to click that back on and leave it there. You have uh, the texture filtering level. I'm just going to leave that at default for now. Glowing block brightness means that when you import, say, a torch or something, it will have an automatic brightness to it. If you recall when I showed over here that we go to color on our arm here, and if I bring up the brightness, that it shows no effect on lighting or anything. The shadows don't affect it. So basically what this is, is when you bring in certain bright blocks like glowstone or torches it'll have a default brightness of 75 percent already enabled so we're going to move on to the last tab here which is render and this is basically all of your quality settings for the final render of your animation and what things are going to look like so while we're messing with this i'm just going to drag this view up as you can see this is expandable just like we showed the resizable thing before and uh, you can move this around and you'll notice real quick that this is giving these black bars and that's because this option is enabled here which is toggle aspect ratio of exported video and since that's enabled it's showing me the actual frame that we're going to be exporting if i disable it then it'll fill up this whole window no matter what typically i like to leave this enabled it kind of depends on what i'm doing but i like to leave it enabled so i can see what my camera is seeing at all times and not think that it's seeing more or less than it actually is. That was kind of a tangent there, but we're just gonna drag this up so we can see. I'm gonna enable rendering. I'm gonna aim our character up a little bit, and I mean our camera up a little bit. Kind of look at this and see what's going on here. You have the SSAO ratio, and that's gonna bring in some of the self-shadowing that you may see here. So if I bring this down, you'll see that some of those shadows go away. If I bring it up, it looks horrendous. And then you have the blur passes, so if I'm gonna want to up that I can make it look a little bit higher quality blur I can make the radius higher or lower so it kind of expands or retracts on how much is being affected by that all that good stuff typically I like to reduce this a bit but you know you can use whatever you want you can also change the color of it so right here we have shadows enabled you can turn that off and that'll get rid of all of your shadowy goodness if you wanted to do something kind of interesting with Minimator, like maybe even a 2D animation or something, maybe a future tutorial or something. Anyway, we're going to leave that enabled. And this gives you your sunlight buffers and your spotlight buffers and your point light buffer. Basically what that is, is how high the quality of the lighting is in your scene. So for instance, by default, I'm pretty sure sun is big. We can make that very big and you'll see that the shadows there changed ever so slightly something if we bring this down to very small then you'll see that those shadows change basically what i would recommend here when you're animating you may want to have all these be very low maybe not so much the sun it kind of depends on how beefy your computer is but definitely for point lights and spotlights because those are very taxing on your system so i recommend keeping them very small or small while you're working and only bumping them up when you need to if you really need to get precise lighting but basically what you're going to do is keep those low and then once you're finally done with your animation and you're ready to render it then bump it up to big or as big as you can your computer can handle and uh, then finally render it and that way you'll have the full quality that you want out of your lighting so down here we have the shadow blur quality which is basically the same thing as the blur passes i have it turned up here but if i turn it down you'll just see that some very you know kind of basic shadows there and then as we bring it up it just increases the quality of the blur of those shadows then of course you have blur size and this kind of changes how blurry they get and all this stuff and it kind of creates a similar effect but you can kind of play with those and get the results that you want and then down here we have depth of field that's what dof stands for is depth of field and that's basically if we go into our camera tab here since the camera is selected we have its options enabled then we can come down here to depth of field and we click on that and you'll see that that actually brings the blur into the background. We can adjust this by reducing the range or the depth of where the camera sees its focus point is, all this good stuff. We'll get into that later. But basically what the depth of field blur size is, is it tells Minimator how blurry you want things that are out of focus to be. So if we bring this way down, then that's not very out of focus at all. If we bring it way up, then it's extremely blurred out. Personally, I like to use something probably between 
the default 2% to maybe about 1%. This is usually what I bring it down to. Uh, you can make it however you want. It really depends on what you want your animations to look like, but that's typically what I do. Here we have anti-aliasing, and this is basically if we just go up here, we'll get kind of a look at the uh, the lines here. You can see here that there's usually some lines, some jaggies there, and this is basically meant to kind of reduce that and make them less sharp. So if you see if I bring it down to zero, you have these really sharp jaggies. If I right click and bring it back up to its default, then it kind of just softens them a little bit. Don't really know it doesn't really help that much but you may just want to probably leave that at default it's up to you experiment and get what you want out of it so finally what we have here is the watermark i already have my version of my animator registered so i can just click this and turn it off but for you if you've just installed it or never registered it before when you go to click this off, it should give you a dialog box and it'll ask you to upgrade Minimator. I recommend you go through with that because otherwise you will have a watermark, a Minimator watermark that shows up in your renders and it's gonna look bad, all right? So what you wanna do is just go to upgrade. There will be an option to donate, but make no mistake, Minimator is free, so you can just choose not to donate. You'll just give it your email address and you will get an email with a code that you can then enter as your key that will register Minimator and then you will be able to untick this to turn off the watermark and you don't have to pay anything. If you have the, the dough to do so, then I recommend you do, you know, help support the people who are working on this and keeping Minimator alive. But uh, if you don't have it and you don't wanna or whatever, then you ain't gotta. So that pretty much does it guys. The last couple things I'm gonna touch on here are these options right here, these buttons. So. You may notice here that this option here is ticked and this one here is not because this is our camera view. So let me make this a little bit smaller. If I click on this, then you will see that we have nothing because this is the camera that's selected. If we click on the zombie, then you'll see that we now have the control points here and that's what that button does. Typically, I wouldn't think that there's any reason you would want to use the active camera viewport here to animate anything. That's why it's off by default anyway, but you can turn that on and off. So some people have lost these uh, control points here and they've been very confused about why that's the case. Well, it's because you may have accidentally turned this off. That's one of the reasons that can happen. Another thing here you have is lighting, and this is basically just kind of a rudimentary preview of the lighting in your scene. Notice that we have these shadows here and whatnot. If I click this, then we have no lighting in the scene, and we can actually see what we're animating. So for instance, if I wanted to animate a night scene, I'm gonna go to background, I'm gonna drag this way down and make it night. Well, I can see what's happening here. Notice in the viewport here for the camera, we have lighting enabled and it looks extremely dark and that's because lighting is enabled. But if I click it here, it'll be the same thing. So if I'm animating at night, I don't want it to be like this where I can't see what's happening. So I'm gonna have that disabled so I can animate and then the final animation will have the darkness that I want the lighting to look like. Same thing with this here, we have particles in view and this basically just toggles on and off the view of particles in your scene in case the particles are kind of overwhelming your computer and making it difficult to animate because it's slowing down. You can say, well, I don't want to see those right now because I'm just working on the animation and we'll just turn it on or whatever when we render it out. And that's basically what that is. And then you have your rule of thirds rulers. I don't really use these, but you know, some people do. And then I explained this one earlier about the aspect ratio for the final video versus what you see in the viewport. So the final thing we're gonna do is show how you can customize the interface by moving these panes around. So if you wanted to say, have this be part of one of these panes here, I can click on the header of it. As you can see, I clicked right around where the, the name is in the, the header of that window or pane. Then when I drag it around, you'll get this yellow thing here, this yellow highlight. And when I let go of it, I'm clicking and holding and dragging. When I let go of it, then it pops into that area there. And then now it's become its own little pane that's part of everything else. If I click and drag it again, I want to put it back down in this corner. So I'm going to hover it right there where you see that square show up, boop, put it there. And then it goes just like that. Same thing goes for any of these. I can drag this around and have this one be way up here. I don't know why you would want to, but hey, you can do it, man. And then that one, as you saw, it kind of highlighted the whole thing. So that means that those are gonna be combined into tabs. So if I click on this one here, you'll see that I can click and drag over and it'll highlight this one. And that means it's gonna become a tab in this pane over here. Typically, I don't want that. So I'm gonna drag it back over. I find that leaving it by default is pretty much how you want it to go. Uh, but if you wanna customize these things and move all these windows around, you're totally free to do so. 
is entirely up to you. So there ends our very long-winded, detailed analysis of Mindimator's interface and how to get started and use the program. We'll come back next time and talk about some more advanced things like how to begin animating a character and all that good stuff. If you have suggestions for what I should talk about in the next one, feel free to leave them in the comments. Otherwise, hopefully this video was helpful to you. I hope you learned something. If you did, feel free to hit that like button, comment, and subscribe to become a citizen today. Share this video with your friends and your family and your pets. If you'd like to support me more directly, there's a Patreon link in the description. But if you can't, that's totally fine. Alright, so thanks for watching guys, and I will see you in the next video.